Hello and welcome to this week's program of the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Each week we connect with and hear from fascinating and inspirational speakers, often with a message focused on our interests on innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. As a Rotary Club, we are always looking for these programs and ways that they might foster new approaches to improving communities near and far. We're glad you've joined us today and hope that you'll enjoy how exploring how technology can serve the business of service to others. This week, we have a very special speaker. It's our own club member, Sandy Stabile, who is uh, going to be speaking to us about medical mission trips overseas um, and some of her experiences on those trips. Uh, after the program, we'll do a short Q&A. And uh, we would like to encourage, uh, at the end of this program, all of those who have enjoyed it to let us know what you think. Below you'll find our discus tool for sharing and responding and making comments about the program. Please take a moment to add to that conversation. And if you also have an idea for a future program that you would like to share, we have a link embedded in our weekly meeting. Please click on that link and let us know about a program you would like to see here in the future. Uh, for members and Rotarian guests, make sure you fill out the attendance section and help us know both about the reach of our efforts and also filling out the attendance form it serves as a makeup for any missed meeting for any Rotarian. If you put your email address properly in the form below, you'll get a message you can pass along to your club secretary. And at, at the final uh, bit of our talk today with Sandy, we will also give her our final word. And Sandy, please take it away. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Um, so I have been um, on many trips, um, and every single one of them is totally special. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, this is my last one that I went to this last February and we went to Myanmar and a lot of people want to know, well, where is Myanmar? It's also called Burma. So I always say, go to China and then go South. So this is Myanmar. And then it's a long, long, skinny um, country that kind of runs down. Um, and it's bordered by China and India, Bangladesh and um, Thailand. Um, so here, this is a picture. And the way I got started in doing trips is um, I was at work one day and one of our operating room nurses saw me in the hallway and she said, oh, um, one of the groups that I go with is looking for a nurse to work in the recovery room. Do you want to go to Peru? And it's like, of course I want to go to Peru. You know, any adventure I'm up, especially if it involves travel. So um, that's how I got started. I um, went on my first um, volunteer trip to Peru and it was amazing and then once you only have to go on one and then you're addicted so I'm just gonna run through my slides so this is our group at the airport um, way that this works is um, this this was an Alliance for Smile um, trip and they're based at us and then they get um, different clubs in the United States or it could be anywhere get global grants to help fund the trips and then we have a host um, Rotary Club where we're going. So um, this is a, an amazing Rotary Club that's only been in existence for three years. It's the Rotary Club of Yangon and um, a while back when the government wasn't being um, so cooperative they made Rotary stop having um, clubs. So this club, I, they do like big projects every single week. It's really amazing. So um, and then this is just a sign um, that was outside where, so the kids stayed in a monastery um, while they're waiting and we we're making a decision to who's going to have surgery. So this was just a sign outside the monastery. And then this group right here, Mimar Kindness, they were a lot like Rotary. So they fundraise and try to do projects to change the people's lives in Myanmar because it's very, very poor. Um, so here is us um, after three plane rides, um, we get to the monastery where the, we're gonna, um, in, the, in the town called Mishkenya that we were gonna work in. And it's the most Northern place in Myanmar that the government allows foreigners. So it's kind of weird to think of yourself as a foreigner, but um, I guess we're all in it together. So uh, everybody wears flip flops. You have to take your flip flops off before you go in. So here we're walking into one of the rooms and then, um, this is just a, a, one of the patients um, that we saw um, outside the monastery. And the, this little one was too little, so we didn't get to do surgery. We have criteria on um, what we have to do safely, do the surgery. Um, so this is inside the monastery. And just like everybody's just 
um, very relaxed and calm. Um, everybody comes with their entire family. The monastery feeds them three meals a day. Um, this is a country where we saw a lot of the fathers participating. So it was really amazing to, um, to see that. Um, and cause usually everywhere you go, the moms are the ones that bring the kids in for screening. The moms are the ones that stay with the kid in the recovery room. But here there's a lot of father participation. Yeah. And then this, I love this picture. Um, this was one of our anesthesiologists and this was her first volunteer mission. And so, um, you know, it's like, there's just so much joy and you can't tell in her eyes that, you know, we've been up for two days and there's so much sleep deprivation, but it's just like, there's just something about, you know, coming um, to do good that just fills you with joy. And then, so here's this little guy with his dad. And I just think they both have such beautiful smiles. Um, and then here's this little boy. And I did not show his after picture because after surgery, because he was not happy at all. He was not happy going in to have a surgery. He was not happy after a surgery. So this is, this is him being happy. So I want, that's what I want you to remember. And then um, I just think this is so funny. No matter where you go in the world, it's always the same. You have kids on their parents' phone. And um, it doesn't matter where they're, they're going to be at. And even... It's just, it's so funny to me. Um, and the um, people, uh, the patients and their families, they loved, loved, loved having their picture taken with us. So this is kind of um, the people that we were going to, um, and their families, we were going to do surgery. Um, this one right here is a Rotarian. Back here are some of, um, he was a non-medical volunteer from Georgia, um, two of our physicians. So it's just, it's so fun. And it's, you know, you can see how colorful it is also. Um, this is the hotel that we stayed at, um, the Hotel Madeira. And then I just, this cracked me up. We, everybody had these bright green bathtubs and like, nobody's ever seen them before. Um, so we just wonder how they got those to Myanmar. <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Um, and then this is the staff that helped us. Um, so it's kind of interesting um, and that the nurses still wear their hats. And then this is where we did screening. So the, um, our goal for each trip is two weeks. Um, each trip is two weeks. And the goal is to do 100 surgeries in that two weeks. Sometimes we can do more because we have more plastic surgeons. This time we only had two. So that means we can only run two rooms. Um, so usually this is just... Um, for lack of a better word, total chaos is screening because there's probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 people in this room at any time. Everybody's talking at the same time. So it's really controlled chaos. So the, the families come in, they go through medical records. Um, you can see right here, there's a scale. All the kids have to be weighed. Um, then next they come to, this was our nurse's station, and we did their vital signs, checked their temperature, their heart rate, their oxygen saturation. Um, we had to do a little finger stick like when... Um, if you're a diabetic and you do a finger stick for your blood sugar and that way we can test their hemoglobin. Um, then they went, there was two uh, tables here and that's the surgeons saw them. Then they're seen by the anesthesiologist and then they were seen by the pediatrician. And then we also had a dental hygienist see them. So it's a pretty thorough screening um, because of course we want to um, just do what's safe and, um, most of the places that we go to, um, if something happens, um, then it's our team that has to stay the night and, you know, take care of the family because the care here is very, very basic. Um, so, um, but our criteria for doing surgery is they have to be at least 10 weeks old, they have to weigh at least 10 pounds, and their hemoglobin has to be 10. Um, and that's because, especially when we do the cleft um, palate surgery, it's very vascular and it bleeds a lot or it can bleed a lot. Um, and so you don't want to have anybody who's really anemic to start. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just going to be some of the pictures that I took during screening. Um, you know, it's always amazing to me, um, like some of these women look so old, but they really aren't. They just they have a really hard life. Um, and then this little girl... 
Um, she was 10 and her teacher found out that our group was coming to do surgery. Um, they have a big like kind of publicity campaign um, of two to four weeks before we come. And um, that way, you know, people know that we're here to provide surgery for their children and it's 100% free for the kids. So her teacher taught her, told her that that we were coming, told her parents, got all of her homework, and then they had um, a three-hour bus ride to come where we were working. And she was just so excited. She was, she was just a little cutie. And then uh, I was just an, a kid with a um, single cleft lip. And then this was my favorite um, little boy. Um, he was just so cute. And you can see this on his face. It's called Thanka, and it's actually from um, tree bark, and they grind it into a paste, and they put it on their skin, and it's supposed to help to prevent um, sunburn, and for women, it's supposed to make your skin really soft. And then here's a picture of me, my little favorite. You're not supposed to have favorites, but we do. And then here's another. This guy was so cute, too. And you can see how, you know, this is like the inside part of his um, palate is out. And then you can see like teeth are just, they grow, whoops, wherever they want. And then uh, no matter where you go, everybody knows the thumbs up sign and the peace sign. So another little cutie. And then another one. And then the, this little boy, we called our Buddha baby because he, I don't know what they were feeding him, but he was gigantic. Um, so, and then um, here's a picture. Somebody brought sunglasses. So it's just so the kids are adorable with sunglasses. So um, I think this is a good time to talk about um, the causes of cleft lips and cleft palates. I think my next one is. Um, so there, the thought is that um, it, Cleft lips and cleft palates are caused by partly um, a vitamin deficiency, and it is thought that it's mostly the B vitamins. Um, it, it's also thought it's the same deficiency that causes spinal bifida. We don't see this very much in the United States or Canada, um, Australia, because our bread, cereal, crackers are all fortified. B vitamins plus most of the women, if they're trying to get pregnant, they've already started on um, prenatal vitamins. Um, in these countries, you know, nutrition is poor. Often they're only eating rice and beans, so you're not getting your B vitamins from your green leafy vegetables. Um, another part is environmental. In many of these countries, they use very toxic chemicals to um, spray crops um, or in manufacturing. They dump the um, the chemicals into the water and that's what people drink. Um, sometimes the ground is contaminated, so that's considered another big part of this. And then lastly, it's genetics. So if someone in your family had a cleft, then you're gonna be 25% um, uh, chance of having a cleft yourself. Um, there's that little boy again. I think my cleft, okay, more. You can tell I love all the kids. Okay, here's a picture of a cleft palate. So basically, this is a hole inside of the child's mouth. Um, th there's um, the, your palate is considered a muscle, so you need your palate to be intact in order to speak well. So if you've ever heard a child speak with a, has a cleft palate, they speak very nasally. Um, and other kids make fun of them. Um, also, this is a really deep one, and it, um, it goes up into the sinuses, and so these children have chronic inner ear infections, so they don't hear well. Um, also, when they eat, um, food can come out of their nose, so it's just a really huge problem. That's why we fix cleft palates, um, and a lot of times people think these children are like developmentally delayed because they don't speak because they don't want people to hear them. And then they don't hear well because they have chronic inner ear infections. So people just think that, um, lack of a better term, that they're, they're stupid, but they're not. Um, so um, the way that this is fixed, I didn't bring a picture because it's kind of bloody, but they actually make an incision here and, and also on the other side, and then this part gets sewn together. So this is a, um, a much bigger surgery than um, getting your lip fixed. 
Um, and then this is just an, a sign that was outside the hospital. We worked at a 550 bed government hospital that was um, really, really poor. It looks pretty nice, but it was, um, it was really, really basic. Um, this is the operating room. You can see it's just literally walls. Um, and then this was the scrub area going into um, one of the rooms. And this was the operating room that we worked at. There's two beds. Um, a lot of times you go in to other countries and there are two beds in one room. Um, in the United States, we wouldn't do this because of cross-contamination, plus um, there, it would be a really big risk to mix things up. Um, but we do what we do. Um, and then this was the recovery room. And up until the day before we came, um, this was their storeroom. So they literally just cleared out uh, their storeroom for us. And it was funny because these beds, you can't really tell how low they are, but they only had one position and that was this low. So it was, it was a good thing that uh, me and the other recovery room nurse were rather short because it would have been difficult. Um, this is how they move supplies around. Um, they have an old wheelbarrow. Um, I don't know why it's pink, but um, that's because at first we thought, well, that's weird. Why, why do you have a wheelbarrow outside the operating room? But it was to move supplies around. And um, look at this old, it's an old trundle sewing machine. And this is how they made drapes and gauze packs um, for their surgery. It was really amazing. Um, it's like, I don't know how old that sewing machine is, but that would be a big time antique here. And then this is how, so they're on the floor. Um, they wash their instruments and then they put them all out on the floor and then they're repackaging them to sterilize. Um, and then this was um, our break room slash, um, this is the sterilizer right here. So when it was done and it would release the steam, like the first time we were there, it was kind of scary because it's like, oh no, we're going to have an explosion or something, but we didn't. So it's just... Um, totally different. And then this is just an example of what we ate. Um, we always had a lot of rice and then veggies. And um, uh, this is their version of salad. And then this was our protein. So it was good, good food. And then this is one of my favorite pictures um, because um, we worked on Saturday. We only have one day off. And so these two orderlies, they... Um, uh, they came in on their day off, which was Saturday. Um, they got paid, but they still, you know, they volunteered to come in because they were so impressed by what we were doing. They wanted to um, be a part of it. So pretty amazing, you know, like, um, and then here's a before and after this little girl. And it's amazing what, you know, an hour and a half. And, you know, if you're a surgeon and you have those skills, what can happen? And then there's this little baby. So a uh, this one, we call it a bilateral cleft lip because it's both sides. Um, and then here she is. So that's pretty amazing. And then, okay, thanks. Um, and then in order to get out of the recovery room, they all have to drink fluids. So this was probably like diluted down Gatorade or something. Um, and then just me holding one of the kids. Um, we put these things on their arms called no-nos so they can't bend their arms and put their hands in their mouth and undo their surgery. Um, then one of the moms just in giving fluids. Um, we got to go to an IDP camp. So this is internally displaced persons camp. So this is the government actually took people's land away from them and then put them in these camps. Uh, it was kind of controversial whether we should go, but our group said um, these people need to know that we know they exist. So they live in these little teeny tiny places. Um, and they get $7 a month for their family. So, um, but they seemed happy. And I love this picture of this old woman. And then I think the next picture is that he was our photographer and the kids, he was really tall and they were just fascinated by this tall American guy. So they just followed him around. Um, some volunteers we had, they were our translators. They were high school students. Um, so no matter where you go, high school students are high school students. Uh, this was just a woman walking around the street. She was selling little pastries. Um, and then we had um, monks, um, you know, asking for alms. Uh, and this, this, I'm almost done. Um, and this is um, the northern part of Myanmar is known for their amber. So this was the amber market. And all these are different colors of amber. 
and then this is just other chunks. And then this is good. Oh, uh, this is a giant piece of jade outside the airport. Um, it's also known for jade, but they told us not to buy it because it's not ethically um, sourced. So we didn't. And then a picture of coming home to San Francisco. So that was good timing. Thank okay. You. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. For your big clap. Thank, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. That is quite uh, an amazing journey. And in two weeks, so much happens. Like you were saying that the number of people that you see in this trip, were you guys able to get reach your goal of a hundred people that you were able to serve? I think we, um, we got up to like 93. So we were close. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from our uh, two participants, Roger and Brian. Do either of you have questions for Sandy that you'd like to ask? I can start if you want. Uh, hi, my name is Brian White from the Rotary Club of Carlisle in the UK. Um, very, very quickly, what, does, what sort of recovery time do you have on these youngsters once the operation is being done? What's a, a good recovery time for them? Um, so the kids, um, everybody can start drinking right away. Um, the kids with the um, cleft lips, um, pretty much, um, you know, it's, I think they say it's about two weeks. Um, the palate's a little bit longer, and we just ask that the parents don't, you know, get put anything sharp in their mouth or, you know, no straws, stuff like that. And then um, when we have a speech pathologist come, then they could also help teach the patients with cleft palates some exercises. So, um, you know, most of them, like, we don't ever get to see them completely healed, but you know, now the technology has changed so much. We have Dermabond. So instead of doing stitches on the outside, they just use, it's like super glue. Um, so unless the kid like really puts their hand in there and, you know, rips it open, um, things, you know, are pretty much healed in two weeks. So, and the kids do really well. I mean, you know, I wouldn't, it, it's, if you watch one of the surgeries, it's kind of barbaric, you know, it's like they got things pulling all over the place and, you know, I think it would hurt and we just give them Tylenol and they do fine. Yeah. It's pretty shocking. Yeah. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, Roger, do you have a question you'd like to ask Sandy? I have a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, once the surgery is finished and the team has gone home, is there any um, medical follow-up on the children for the possibility of infection or anything like that? Um, yes, we um, uh, always have a partner um, in whatever city that we worked in um, through Rotary um, who watches, you know, um, in case there's any problems. And, um, but there is definitely follow up and the, the kids with cleft palates, they're, um, on antibiotics for, I think five days, just because it, they're at risk for infection, but the lips, no, they just, they get to go home and kind of carry on. <laughs> That's amazing. The, um, the second question that I have of you is, uh, is an observation. I know that, um, in Camelops here that uh, there's a group that does, a medical uh, mission as well. But um, one of the things that has always amazed me is that each of the participants, in terms of the doctors and the nurses, they give freely of their time mm -hmm. and they also pay for their own expenses. And I just think that is an, an absolutely incredible uh, thing that you do, and I uh, really applaud um, each of you for going on those types of missions. And um, I would like, to, on behalf of our club, to thank you very, very much for participating, and because it's such a worthwhile endeavor. Thank you again. Thank you. You know, uh, we always say that we get more than what we give. You know, um, and so you know, but it's it's amazing like I said once you go on one trip you're addicted and you know sometimes you know people are like well how many trips have you been on and I'm like well you know maybe 20 and then like people are like that's a lot and it's like no I'm kind of a slacker because you know I know this person's been on 40 and this person you know but it's they're all different they're all wonderful you know but thank you for those kind words so 
Well, truly, Sandy, it is quite amazing. And uh, if there are any resources that you would like our club members to know about or a link we can put to at the bottom of this program, please just let us know. Um, also, if there's any way that we can support your work or the organizations that you have gone through, um, let us know as well, because we would very much like to do that. Um, and for this portion of the program, I would like to give you the last word, but then I'd like to ask you to stay at the end of the, once we close off the recording, because maybe we'll have some additional questions. Okay. okay. So take it away, Sandy. You can have the last word. Okay, I would say that as my final word, um, by going to different countries and places that, I mean, I probably would never go to Myanmar on vacation or Nicaragua or, you know, some of these places I've gone. What you find is no matter where you go in the world, there are good people and everyone wants the best for their child. And so no matter where you go, you know, I think we're more the same than we are different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Sandy. Okay, thank you. Today. Thanks.